the historic West End of Charlotte, North Carolina, has a rich heritage and a hoped-for future. That's what this is about. Sameness in diversity. That's what we are all struggling for, uh, trying to understand in terms of our lived experience. Many people, when they think of historic places in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, they think of the Mint Museum, or they think of First Presbyterian Church, or they think of Davidson College. Well, let me tell you something. If you judge the historic significance of a place in terms of the events and people that transformed our community, I would suggest that we are in the most historic place in Charlotte and that is the West Trade Street, Beatty's Ford Road corridor. I agree 100 percent. As a matter of fact, I'll say it is uh, number one on list. Charlotte's historic West End, or the West Trade Street, Beatty's Ford Road corridor, was the birthplace of Charlotte's civil rights movement. To look at scenes of Charlotte's segregated past is poignant and painful. In 1941, the teachers at Charlotte's Second Ward High School made a movie of their students in hopes of advancing their self-esteem and sense of self-worth. The pictures speak for themselves. Note the quality of the playground. Interestingly, Young African Americans had a special feeling for schools, like Second Ward, or West Charlotte for that matter, because they were in essence oases in an otherwise hostile world. The students and faculty are coming out of the school for a special ceremony Wait till you see what it's about. Raising the flag. saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Very moving. Very interesting. The schools were segregated. We lived in a segregated society. And, and I didn't have the kind of sensitivity uh, that I should have had in those early years. And I'm still trying to figure out, active in the school, politics, and all the students trying to figure out, still, what we're going to do to change. If I dressed up reasonably and went downtown in Charlotte, North Carolina, on the square, and went into Woolworths, not only could I not get a hot dog, then sit. I could get a hot dog and go out and sit on the curb. If I wanted to take a young lady down who I had met or not in college at Winston-Salem or whatever, 
Christmas? Well, I don't know. What kind of what kind of dignity is that? Dorothy Counts traveled from the historic West Side to Harding High School in 1957 to be among the first African American students to integrate the Charlotte Public Schools. It was from the historic West End that 212 Johnson C. Smith University students walked to participate in Charlotte's first sit-in. Charles Jones remembers. Came back and organized, had a meeting of the students. And I announced that tomorrow, this was February 8th, 1960. I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to put on my best Sunday go to meetings. That means the ch church closed when you look at that little sweet water so you smell. And I'm going down to Woolworths and I'm going to sit there until they open up. I thought maybe that'd be a handful, man. The next morning in front of Biddle Hall, with 212 students from JCSU said, let's rock and roll. The civil rights movement bore fruit. Fred Alexander, a resident of the historic West End, was the first African American in the 20th century elected to the Charlotte City Council. But progress came at a price. Bombs ripped through the homes of prominent civil rights leaders, including Fred Alexander and Dr. Reginald Hawkins in November of 1965. Well, this is a cumulative thing. Uh, it's a reign of terror that has existed in North Carolina now. This is what it you is. say they. Do you have any idea who it may be? I have my beliefs. Uh, I don't want to incriminate anyone, but I'm quite sure it's either the Klan or people of the Klan mentality. In many ways, the culmination of Charlotte's civil rights movement occurred when Vera and Darius Swan, residents of the historic West End, approached young attorney Julius Chambers and asked him to take their case to the courts to force the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools to proactively integrate. This eventually led to a ruling by the federal courts in April 1971 that forced full integration. The buses rolled. I think Julius Chambers uh, is a man of humility, but of such tremendous uh, intellectual power and he used that knowledge and that skill in a way that literally changed the course and direction of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County and indeed this nation. Case made, case made. The West Trade Street Beatty's Ford Road corridor, Charlotte's historic West End, is of preeminent local historic significance and its roots go deeper than the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s. The oldest neighborhood in the historic West End is Biddleville. The first houses in Biddleville were built in the 1870s. The neighborhood, the oldest surviving predominantly African-American community in Charlotte, North Carolina, takes its name from Biddle Institute, the original name of what is now Johnson C. Smith University. Biddle Institute formally opened on April 7, 1867. Two white Presbyterian ministers led the effort to establish a school to train leaders for the newly freed African-American population. Reverend S.C. Alexander and Reverend W.L. Miller. 
it took a lot of sacrifice. I mean, you're thinking at a time of period when white ministers such as S.C. Alexander and W.L. Miller saying that we are going to start a historical black university during 1867. Biddle Institute moved in 1873 from uptown to an eight-acre parcel donated by W.R. Myers, a white charlatan. During the 1870s, Reverend Stephen Mattoon, the white president of Biddle, began selling lots to African Americans who wanted to live near the college. That was the beginning of Biddleville. In 1876, the school, which was named in honor of Major Henry Jonathan Biddle, became Biddle University. The first African American professor was Dr. George E. Davis, who lived with his wife, Marie Davis, in their imposing home on Campus Street. The university and its surrounding neighborhood thrived. Many, many years ago, the first president of uh, Johnson C. Smith University, then known as the Biddle Institute, President Montoon, described it as a place where there was a high level of colored intelligence. Now, the language is archaic, but we get the point. It was a vibrant place where uh, African Americans could uh, engage in uh, quality living and uh, engage in high thoughts about where they were going with the American dream. President Mattoon raised the money to build Biddle Hall in 1883, the finest example of Victorian institutional architecture in the city. When I drive up Interstate 77, my eyes are immediately drawn to this magnificent building. You have to realize that it was built in 1883. Look at all the intricate brickwork. Look at the different types of windows. When you stand in front of Biddle Hall, it's almost scary, the building's so powerful. Inside, it's just as lavish. Mattoon raised some of the money to build this building from white charlatans. Everything is spacious, big, grand. Look at the size of this handrail. This is the Sarah Belk Gambrell Auditorium. President William Howard Taft spoke here. You can imagine Stephen Mattoon holding forth as the students gathered. Look at the art glass windows. Look at the intricacy of the support system for the roof. This building is just absolutely stunning. Anybody who cares about beauty in terms of architecture should visit Biddle Hall. Th there's simply nothing else like it in the city. And it is atop a hill, and it makes a statement about Biddle Institute, Biddle University, Johnson C. Smith University. Carter Hall, it too bespeaks of Victorian architecture. See that cupola up on the top? See the corner towers? The longest serving president of the university was Dr. Henry L. McCrory from 1907 until 1947. A Biddle graduate and former faculty member, McCrory brought major changes to the institution. 
On November 15, 1911, the cornerstone was laid for the Carnegie Library building. Among the speakers was Daniel Augustus Tompkins, owner of the Charlotte Observer and locally famous New South Industrialist. In 1921, Jane Barry Smith of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, gave $700,000 to the school in honor of her deceased husband, Johnson C. Smith. And the name of the college was changed to Johnson C. Smith University. The Duke Endowment made the school one of its beneficiaries in 1924. The Board of Trustees voted in 1932 to admit women. Johnson C. Smith University increasingly became a festive part of Charlotte's historic West End. Do you feel the same way driving up Beatty's Ford Road that you do driving down Providence Road? Well, there's a vision being advanced for the West End that would make the answer to that question, yes. And it's a vision, if it is realized, that would transform the nature of this city. Charlotte wouldn't be the same place, regardless of where you reside. Dr. Ronald Carter assumed the position of president in 2008. President Carter brings a cosmopolitan perspective to his job. A native of High Point, North Carolina, and graduate of Morehouse College and Boston University. Dr. Carter worked as a health services and academic administrator in Johannesburg, South Africa, where he reached out to impoverished communities. He was a visiting scholar at Robert College, Istanbul, Turkey. In 1997, Dr. Carter returned to the United States and served Coker College in Hartsville, South Carolina, where he established a distinguished international visiting scholars program. I think uh, Dr. Carter uh, probably has uh, been more important to Johnson C. Smith University than any, uh, any president uh, in my memory. Dr. Carter has a vision, a bold vision, and it's based upon four fundamental beliefs. First, that Charlotte, to become a world-class city, must embrace racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity. It's inevitable. Uh, the um, Demographic projections indicate that uh, there's not going to be any majorities anymore. The, the white majority will uh, lose its superior numbers uh, and become a minority. The blacks will remain a minority. The Hispanics will be a minority. We're all going to be minorities uh, in, uh, in the future, so that uh, diversity is a uh, absolute Necessity. I take seriously uh, Charlotte's commitment to become a world-class uh, city, and I have lived, uh, you know, all over the world, and I know what world-class cities uh, look like, feel like, taste like, smell like, and so I'm saying, if we have this vision, then what must we do? And I'm just simply trying to make sure that we are coherent consistent and cogent about the vision we have for Charlotte and I think that Johnson C. Smith University has an important role to play so that's why I do what I do. Second, that Johnson C. Smith University is Charlotte's premier private independent urban university and must accordingly play a major role in making Charlotte more diverse. So it is my job to do exactly what I'm doing 
reaching out and developing uh, the community around us. Now, also related to that is the understanding of what an urban university is, and Johnson C. Smith prides itself in being Charlotte's premier independent urban university. One of the defining characteristics of an urban university is that it understands its place in community. Every, every so often you get these kinds of urban thinking presidents of universities. It doesn't happen every time, but once every cycle you might get one or two that come in and, and really understand how to merge a university, an urban campus with the surrounding community. Third, that the West Trade Street Beatty's Ford Road Corridor or Charlotte's historic West End is uniquely suited to become Charlotte's first showcase neighborhood of diversity. And I just see uh, the Northwest Corridor becoming a point of destination and celebration for the best of Charlotte. Now there's something also very important about the Northwest Corridor. We just recently, the university, uh, undertook a study entitled The Soul of the Northwest Corridor. It's a follow-up to that pioneering study uh, funded by the Knight Foundation on the Souls of Cities. And we looked at the attachments uh, in the Northwest Corridor. One of the attachments surprised everyone, and it was basically this, that the Northwest Corridor is the corridor in Charlotte that is open to diversity and inclusiveness. Biddleville is one of the most diverse culturally, lifestyle. So I'm living in the beloved community. Fourth, the means to initiate greater diversity in Charlotte's West End is to build new infrastructure and restore those buildings and places that highlight the rich history of the corridor. He has a vision for Johnson C. Smith University that is much more than that campus sitting out on West Trade Street. I think he sees Johnson C. Smith University as the catalyst for bringing about change in the whole uh, northwestern part of the city. And indeed, I think it is beyond that. I think it will ultimately have a change uh, impact, a change in the way this community relates to uh, our African-American citizens that live out in that area. Uh, he has also, I think, recognize that a part of it uh, deals with infrastructure. That is to say, you have to build uh, facilities. Uh, you have to build uh, homes. You have to have uh, the kind of uh, opportunities for people to be engaged in uh, creating space. And once you get that, once you see that this part of town is equally as good as the other part of town, it helps bring about a different attitude, a different uh, kind of, of uh, situation. Mosaic Village, uh, a $20 million project that's going to completely transform the quarter. Four-story parking deck, uh, 4,000 square feet green roof on top. 7,500 square feet of retail, um, suite apartments for students, uh, 80 suites that will take in 300 students. Uh, that will be completed in September of 2012. It will be the catalytic project for the quarter that invites other developments along the way. The thing that impresses me about what President Carter suggests is that Biddleville already has a multiracial, multicultural, diverse history. But the greatest thing about this community that I stated earlier was the leadership that was always diverse. Well, for me, uh, in personal terms, uh, I do not like destroying anything that is beautiful or has the potential 
to be restored to its beauty. Um, that uh, house is historic. It has very precious memories for uh, Johnson C. Smith and its commitment to community and the development of schools across the country for uh, uh, then colored uh, students. We should not uh, erase that. And then it's a very fine piece of architecture that I don't think we really want to lose uh, in this vibrant city as it continues to grow. Dr. Carter realizes that history is not the past. It's our consideration of the past. By preserving the Davis House, it's a matter of connecting yesterday with today with tomorrow, cultural continuity. That beginning out of black and white, Protestant and North and Southern collaboration gives Biddleville a diversity that it needs to exploit. It is, for it to succeed, they're going to have to have a narrative. And I think he has chosen to take on one of the most difficult challenges of any visionary leader. And that's changing people's uh, opinion, changing people's ideas, changing people's thought process. What do you think about West Trade Street? What do you think about the people who live on West Trade Street? And he, I believe, is convinced, and I believe that he will succeed in helping all of us understand that those are people who are a major part of this community. I had a student in class ask me, um, do you think we are living the dream of Martin Luther King. Um, and I said to him that, that we are living um, the seeds of the dream, but we've not right reached the dream yet. I think uh, as African Americans and as, as Caucasian Americans and Latinos and Asians and all the, the multiplicity of ethnic groups that are here in America, we are all stumbling and I do say stumbling forward toward a, a uh, united culture and community. You know, it is true still to this day that many people who grow up in Charlotte and who know Charlotte simply don't ever drive over there, Mr. Brown. And you're exactly right. Uh, and you have to ask why. And we are right back where we started in our discussion, artificial boundaries. Mm -hmm.